Here's a presentation which has been prepared by my colleague Raquel Fernandez and myself for the face-to-face -face and online courses for Lenguados related to bilingualism. The first thing you have to do is a short task and I'd like you to read the six questions and decide if you think they're true or false. So you might want to pause the video now, take a pen and paper and write down your answers to these. Perhaps your opinions will change during the course of this presentation and at the end you might want to go back to this slide and see if you've changed any of your opinions. And now another very simple task. What is a bilingual person? Again, I'd like you to pause the video with a pen and paper, think about it and complete this sentence. A bilingual person is somebody who... dot dot dot. And the next question. Are you bilingual? Do you consider yourself to be bilingual? Maybe you can take the definition you've just written and according to that definition decide if you think you personally are bilingual or not. It's actually more complex than we might think. Bilingualism is a very broad concept and there are many different contexts in which people could be bilingual. So if we take for example Mexican children living in the United States trying to learn English they're bilingual. But it's also the case when Spanish people living in Spain are studying uh, a lot of English to improve their level of English. So it's clear that bilingualism can be developed in many different contexts. If you're monolingual, if you only speak one language, you're in the minority in the world population. There are more bilingual or plurilingual people than there are monolinguals. Uh, many scholars prefer the term plurilingualism to refer to the individual capacity of using one or more language in different circumstances. And these type of people are the majority in the world. So it's very important to remember that to be bilingual doesn't mean that a person can speak two languages perfectly. Uh, a bilingual person can speak more than one language but that doesn't mean they need to speak that language to a native-like level to be considered bilingual. Perfect bilinguals do exist. These are people who can speak two or more languages at a very high level, at a native-like level, but they're very uncommon. Uh, bilingualism is more like a scale. There are degrees to which you have a command or control of a language. So you don't need to speak two languages like a native speaker to be considered bilingual. And here you can see a range of different types of bilingual, from additive, ascendant, balanced, etc. Now, it might be a good idea for you to pause the video here and to read through these and to see if you can identify, perhaps, which type of bilingual you are. The good news is, perhaps if earlier in this video you thought you weren't bilingual, now you are bilingual because I'm sure you fit into one of these categories or perhaps a combination of these categories. So, as you can see, as I said before, and I'd like to repeat, being bilingual doesn't mean that you have a native-like capacity in two languages necessarily. So for a long time, bilinguals were seen as having two separate monolingual competencies. And the name for this was the fractional hypothesis. And you can see in the picture, uh, there is a certain limited amount of space in the brain. And you have your proficiency in one language and your proficiency in another language or languages. And this model supported the view that if you learnt a foreign language, this took away space from the proficiency in the first language because there wasn't any space for more. So the idea here is that these are two very separate things, almost competing with each other. But then, in the 1980s, along came Jim Cummings. Um, he's a very well-known linguist, very famous uh, linguist, university professor 
in Ontario in Canada, uh, one of the leading experts on bilingual education and second language acquisition. Um, and he contradicted this fractional hypothesis we saw before with his developmental independence hypothesis, which we're going to see a little bit more about now. And these will come in exact words. So the idea is that instruction in language X uh, is effective in promoting proficiency in language X. So let's say uh, in Spanish, if you have good instruction in Spanish, it promotes proficiency in Spanish. But the transfer of this proficiency uh, can also occur to language Y. Mm, so this proficiency helps in the acquisition of the second language as well. And it will happen if there is enough exposure, enough contact with language Y, either at school or from the motivation in the environment um, to learn this language. So, to explain simply, here's an example. If the teaching of the Spanish language is effective and students develop their communicative proficiency in this language, this learning can be transferred to English if students are exposed to the language and are motivated to learn it. So this is what Cummins' model looks like. The fractional hypothesis on the left, we have these two separate proficiencies, but Cummings believes that actually it's the same proficiency for both languages. It's combined. So that the development of uh, language proficiency in one language will also have a positive effect on the development of language proficiency in the other language and vice versa. Now this is the common image, the common metaphor associated with Cummins' developmental independent interdependence hypothesis. So what we have is uh, two icebergs you can see floating on the surface of the water and they each have their own features, their own characteristics which we can see. But underneath those icebergs what we can't see is the common underlying proficiency. This is the central operating system. So take in your case you speak English and Spanish or Spanish and English perhaps um, and the characteristics that can be seen of those two languages are a little bit different. You may have higher proficiency in one than in the other but underneath it's a common operating system which is helping you to develop both. So they stem from the same origin, the same motor. And Ophelia Garcia explains this very nicely. She says, a bilingual individual can have different phonology, sounds, morphology, word formation, syntax, the arrangement of words in sentences, and lexicon, words, vocabulary, in each of their languages. But the motor that makes language use and practice possible is exactly the same for each language. Also, what is learned in one language does not have to be relearned in another because conceptual knowledge transfers and it's only the linguistic labels that you might have to teach. So, you can learn a concept in English or you can learn it in Spanish. But when you have the concept, you have it. The only thing you might not have is the label, the word for that exact concept in the other language, temporarily. But of course, it's a question of learning these labels. Here you have a bibliography for this presentation. Uh, I would particularly recommend the first book by Baker and the last book by Garcia as good places to find out more information about the topics we've seen in this presentation. And now, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, uh, I'd like you to go back to the start and look at the six true-false questions and see if, in the light of having watched this presentation and reflected on the contents, are there any things that you would like to change.